I have to hear the name. All right, pray for uh, Connect. This we have a great fellowship time. So thanks for everyone that brought food and is going to come hang out with us. And uh, yeah, we got nothing else. So I'll uh, pray and um, get on with the day. So uh, <clears throat> Father, I am just so thankful that we get to be in your presence that wherever we are at and, and whatever we are doing, that we get an opportunity to have you just walk with us and talk with us and lead us and guide us. So we just ask today that that is exactly what you will do, from the words that you have put upon my heart to every place that um, we have all collectively are and, and uh, whatever we brought in today, that you will just speak directly to it. Father, we lift up the unspoken prayer requests. Sometimes our burdens are great and the words are few, but you know exactly what we're asking. You know exactly what we need. You know the burden that we each have for something or someone. So just speak into those today. Show us your presence around those today and this week as we go out. Pray for the people that are unable to join us, that they will just feel your presence and your camaraderie and and just feel you in a mighty, mighty way. Thank you for everyone that came out today and is going to hang out with us and, and worship and pray over Children's Church. Father, we love you. We are so thankful for you. So glad that we get to be here with other believers and not worry about someone crashing through the doors and telling us we can't. So, Father, help us to continue to fight for that, the freedom to do as we desire to worship and praise you. In the Son's name we pray. Amen. I didn't even go with an iPad. I thought about you and went with a tablet. Um, before I get too far into this, I just wanted to say thank you to you guys. Um, this past week I've done a lot of reflecting on my 12 years at Castle Rock Nazarene Church because, for those that don't know, I got a unanimous four-person vote to get my district license. So it doesn't mean I have it. Um, so it doesn't mean I have it. It just means that they are going to tell the board that they should let me have it. Um, so it still has to go through the board vote. But... I think as much as I've done the work, you guys have supported me and you guys have loved me and you guys have patiently helped me to bring the right tools to the right situations. I'm learning not everything needs a hammer. Sometimes a screwdriver will work. So um, people put $25 a week in the offering plate when I didn't really have a job to get me here. Um, so... I may have gotten the unanimous vote, but it's because of you guys. So I really want you guys to know that thank you, thank you, thank you for loving me and being merciful with me and helping me um, to get here, supporting this calling. So I appreciate you guys. Don't know how else to say it, but thank you. Um, all right. Today, today... Um, I have titled it Battle Plans. I wanted to just title it Winning. I love titles. I don't know why, but they just make me happy when something is titled. And uh, we're going to be looking in Judges 20, which is, has anyone ever spent some time in Judges? That is a messed up book, folks. Anyone spent time in Judges? Whew. I was started reading that, and I am like, this should not be in the Bible, because this is weird. But I landed in Judges because I've been doing an awesome study in the book of Ruth, which I'll share with you guys the second and third Sundays in February. And I wanted to get some context for what was happening in, in the book of Ruth. And so I flipped through and was reading Judges, and I landed on Judges 20. And that's where I've kind of spent the last week. And uh, couldn't quite figure out why God was having me here. And it really took me quite a little bit of time to work through it. 
but here's what I've landed on, is we all have battles we are fighting. Some of it is internally. We have battles that no one else is going to see, but we wake up every day and fight them. Some of it is financially. We have battles every day because we just, what we have going out does not match what we have coming in, and we're trying to navigate that. Relationship battles. We have people in our lives that, quite frankly, we are like, go fly a kite someplace other than me, right? Um, this church, we are going to have, I don't want to say battles, that puts in the, the wrong connotations, but we've got some hard choices and some choices that are going to push us into the future that we need to make. And so... I feel like that's why God put this on my heart because I want us to be successful and victorious in every battle that we're fighting. So my first question is, who are you following into your battles? Now the Israelites speak up. Now all you Israelites speak up and tell me what have you decided to do? So context for this statement. There was a, a Levite with his concubine, I'm sure there's a whole sermon in and of itself right there, whose concubine ended up being killed by men in the tribe of Benjamin. So men in his own nation, one of the other tribesmen, ends up killing this concubine. Now what he does with her is, is messed up, and I'm, feel free to read it yourself. Um, there are some, as one pastor put it, Levitical UPS. Um, but he is mad about it. He is frustrated. He is hot. He is tired. So he gets the 11 other tribes to come together, tells them the entire story, and then says, what are you going to do about it? All the men rose up together as one, saying, none of us will go home. No, not one of us will return to his house. But now this is what we'll do to Gebeah. We'll go up against it in the order decided by casting lots. We'll take ten men out of every hundred from all the tribes of Israel, and a hundred from a thousand, and a thousand from ten thousand, to get provisions for the army. Then when the army arrives at Gebeah in Benjamin, it can give them what they deserve for this outrageous act is done in Israel. <clears throat> so all the Israelites got together and united as one against the city. So what we're seeing right here, very quickly, has anyone heard of mob mentality or herd mentality? Right? It's not necessarily a bad thing. Disneyland used herd mentality for their fireworks show and now they make millions of dollars. So if you harness it correctly, it's not necessarily a bad thing. But herd mentality is a behavior in which people act the same way or adopt similar behaviors as the people around them, often ignoring their own feelings in the process. So you have one guy who's really mad. I don't want to fall over this. Um, about something that happened, and he using emotion and everything else whips into a fury the 11 tribes of Israel. And that seems kind of crazy, right? We don't see that too much nowadays. But as I was researching herd mentality, I came across caterpillars. You guys have ever seen a caterpillar in a straight, caterpillars in a straight line? A famous French naturalist conducted an experiment by putting caterpillars nose to tail in a circle. In the middle of that circle, he put food. Those caterpillars walked in that circle till they died because they thought that the person in front of them was going to go to food. And the person in front of them thought the person in front of them was going to go to food. And so it continued until the caterpillars, seven days later, died. And now I know that hopefully we're not all circling the food, that happens next door. I will be the first person to break that chain. But um, think about some examples in our world. Burning Man Festival. Who's heard of Burning Man Festival? <sighs> that place is crazy. Don't look it up. Please don't look it up. Um, 
but it began in 1986 as a small gathering of friends and has evolved into a week-long event attended by 50,000 people. It's described as an experimental society and a temporary metropolis dedicated to community, art, self-expression, and self-reliance. There are only a handful of rules, and the most involve maintenance and outhouse usage. Herd mentality. Because I think at Burning Man, they don't like to wear clothes. So you have 50,000 naked people running around, because who wants to be the one person with clothes on? Okay, I would, personally. But I'm not going to Burning Man, right? Herd mentality. What about anyone experienced Black Friday shopping? Okay, I worked at Costco, true story. Black Friday, we get there, and I, everyone came through and grabbed all of those. That was when um, portable DVD players were huge. There's one left in the box. There was an entire pallet above me, but there was one left in the box. I saw two grown women fight each other over a portable DVD player. Like, it came to blows. They had to call security, and I was like, but herd mentality, right? I have to get it. It's the best deal. I have to do it. So where does that fall in our battle plan? Who are you following? Who are you trusting, and where are they going, is my question. Because it's really easy to fall into, well, we need to do this because it's the way that it's always been done. Or... Because so-and-so said it, and emotionally I agree with it, we're going to make that happen. Um, there was a professor. So here's how you break herd mentality. You become the 5% that's going in a different direction, and you become the leader of the herd. <clears throat> there was a, two professors that conducted an experiment where they told subjects to walk in a random path inside of a big hall but don't tell anyone what you're doing. Then they grabbed a couple of those people, and they said, here's the path that you're going to walk. And what they noticed is the people that were walking with purpose got the followers. The people that were randomly walking, they randomly walked alone until someone walked by them with purpose, and then they followed that person that was walking with purpose. So what is your purpose? Because if you walk in that purpose, and you walk purposely, that herd mentality is not going to get you whipped up into a frenzy. You're going to start to have your own ideas, your own opinions. You all probably have those, but your own thoughts. And now what happens is that instead of, I have paper copy, because my, lab, my tablet's down to like 5%. So, um, so what happens is that instead of the church following, the church becomes leaders. The people in the church become leaders as we walk with a purpose. So that's the first thing. That's the first battle plan. That's the first thing that we should have. What is your purpose? And set it each and every day. That's five min minutes with God. I've been working really hard at five o'clock rolling out of bed and spending some time with Jesus. It doesn't make my day easier. It makes my day purposeful. I remember what I'm doing. I remember why I'm doing it. I remember that somewhere there needs to be a leader who's not going to follow the crowd and who's going to lead people to Jesus. So, battle plan. Find your purpose. Second point. Fight doesn't make right. So I'll... The tribes of Israel sent messengers throughout the tribe of Benjamin saying, what about this awful crime that was committed among you? Now turn those wicked men of Gebeah over to us so that we may put them to death and purge the evil from Israel. But the Benjaminites would not listen to their fellow Israelites. From their towns they came together at Gebeah to fight against the Israelites. At once the Benjaminites mobilized 26,000 swordsmen from their towns, in addition to 700 able young men from those living in Gebeah. Among all of these soldiers were 700 select troops who were left-handed, and each of whom could sling a stone at a hare and not miss it. 
Israel, apart from Benjamin, mustered 400,000 swordsmen, all of them fit for battle. The Israelites went up to Bethel and inquired of God. They said, who of us is to go first to fight against the Benjaminites? The Lord replied, Judah shall go first. Okay, we're going through 25. The next morning, the Israelites got up and pitched camp near Gebeah. The Israelites went out to fight the Benjaminites and took up battle positions against them. The Benjaminites came out of Gebeah, cut down 22,000 Israelites on the battlefield that day. But the Israelites encouraged one another and again took up their positions where they had stationed themselves the first day. The Israelites went up, wept before the Lord until evening, and they inquired of the Lord. They said, Shall we go up again to fight against the Benjaminites, our fellow Israelites? The Lord answered, Go up against them. Then the Israelites drew near to Benjamin the second day. This time when the Benjaminites came out from Gebeah to oppose them, they cut down another 18,000 Israelites, all of them armed with swords. Was the nation of Israel, the 11 tribes, fighting? Short leash, keep me from walking around, I guess. All right, so the nation of Israel was absolutely fighting a good fight. They were fighting against the sin of the Benjaminites. The Benjaminites who killed a, an innocent woman just because they could. But just because we are fighting the right fight or fighting because of what God says is right, doesn't mean that we are right with God. Okay? Does that make sense? So just because we take on the right fight doesn't mean we are victorious because the fight is right. We are victorious because we get ourselves right with God. And that's what the nation of Israel didn't do. Right? So I was trying to find non-political examples (laughs) of what this may look like. And basically, it's hypocrisy. The nation of Israel were hypocrites. They had spent, from the time of Joshua's death until this moment, living in this sin, oppression, repentance, repeat cycle. They would sin. They would have idols. They would worship the wrong people. They would just be horrible. They would get oppressed by someone. They would repent. God would send a savior. So they would be delivered, and then the cycle would start over. So they were living this hypocrisy of a life. The best example I could find was Henry David Thoreau, the author of a book called Walden. And it was a book on the philosophy of self-reliance. So he supposedly lived off the grid, hung out in the forests, had nothing else. Like he was his own man. But when he visited town, he dropped his clothes off at his mom's house to be washed. <laughs> right? Anyone watch uh, Man vs. Wild, Bear Grylls? Anyone watch that? Okay. I was going to learn about, a lot about my TV habits. Anyway, he takes people out into these extreme situations and teaches them how to survive. But if you read the caption, it says, Do not attempt at home. He has help. And if the weather gets too bad, they pick him up in a helicopter and take him to a hotel. So he's preaching self-reliance and survival, but if it gets too hard, just do it the easy way. So basically, can we go to Matthew 7? I give that one to you. This is what it comes down to. Why do you look at the speck of sawdust in your brother's eye and pay no attention to the plank in your own? How can you say to your brother, let me take the speck out of your eye when all the time there is a plank in your own. You hypocrite, first take the plank out of your own eye, and then you will see clearly to remove the speck from your brother's eye. We have to get right with God. And I'm not saying we're all a whole bunch of us running around wrong with God. 
but maybe God has asked us to do something that we're dragging our feet on. Maybe God is asking us not to do something that we're continuing to do. Right? There's a lot of ways that we can be not right with God. And so, how do we get right? So 26. <clears throat> so they've just lost, what was it, 40,000 men? A 400,000 person army has lost 40,000 men two days in a row. And what's funny is you read that, that I didn't put in here because I wasn't sure where it fit. They encouraged each other, but no one encouraged them to go to God. So after the first day, when they lost, they were all like, hey, you got it. You got it. We got this. We're going to go again. We're going to go back to the place where we started. We're going to put this fight again. We have 400,000 men. We can do this. So they went day two. Nothing changed. There was no battle plan different. They just did the same thing that they had done before, and they lost again. So who is encouraging you in these battles? Because if it is someone who is fighting the battle with you, and right, we have people that are like, oh, hey, so I haven't won this war yet, but let me tell you what you should do. Financially, I'm a hot mess, but let me tell you where to invest. Relationships are not, they're falling apart, but let me tell you how to handle yours. Right? Can we all think about someone like that? I have a few people who are like, oh, you're single? Let me tell you how to be successful. And I'm like, I don't want your kind of success. Like, that's not, no, that's gross. Um, so who is encouraging you in this battle? Does that make sense? And if it's someone that hasn't figured out how to win the battle, find someone else to get encouragement. Hopefully, there are people in this church that have won battles that we can reach out to and say, how do I do this? But don't go to someone that's in the same boat as you. It's great to have encouragement, but if you want to win the battle, make sure that it's with someone else who has won a battle. So finally, the nation of Israel decides they have to do something different. <clears throat> so then all the Israelites, the whole army, went up to Bethel, and there they sat weeping before the Lord. They fasted that day, until evening, and presented burnt offerings and fellowship offerings to the Lord. So, you have 27? Did I not give you 27? That's fine. You have 27 and 28. And the Israelites inquired of the Lord. In those days, the Ark of the Covenant of God was there with Phinehas, son of Eleazar, the son of Aaron, ministering before it. They asked, Shall we go up again to fight against the Benjaminites, our fellow Israelites, or not? The Lord responded, Go, for tomorrow I will give them into your hands. Does anyone know, see the difference in God's response? The first two times he says, Go. The second, third time he says what? I will give them into your hands your hands. So there is a way to get right and a way to win. <clears throat> the first one, 26, and all the Israelites, the whole army, went up to Bethel, and there they sat weeping before the Lord. In Hebrew, Bethel literally means the house of God. They decided to get into the house of God, to the presence of God. Collectively, as a group, they went to the house of God. Sometimes in our battles, in our fights, we do it alone. Sometimes in our battles and in our fights, we don't want to show up to a church on Sunday because what if they know that I'm battling something? Through my 12 years here, I have battled depression and anxiety. And for some of you, that may be a shock. Because I didn't tell anybody. 
I would show up Sunday after Sunday, pretend that everything was fine, go home and sleep 18 hours a day, barely getting out of bed, barely being successful. But I didn't want anyone to know. Clint may look at me weird if he knew that the children's director suffered from depression. I'm not saying he would, but that's what I thought. Why would you trust me with your children if I can't get my own stuff right? Right? So sometimes we don't want to be here. We don't want to be with other believers because they shine light on our battle. And yet that is exactly what they did. They lost it twice. They lost two days of this battle. And when they finally said, you know what? Let's go together to the house of God. Let's weep collectively together. That is the one thing that I miss about Rio the most. When your heart broke, his heart broke. And I will say that I'm working on that, but that's not always the case with me. Your heart is broken, I will hug you, and I will love you, but my heart is not as tender to break with yours. But maybe that's where we need to get. That when a person walks in this door and they are beat up and they are broken and they just decided to come be in the house of God, we weep with them. We weep for them. Right? That is what the first step is to winning a battle. So if you have a battle in your life right now and you are sitting in this church, amen, thank you, praise to God, let's pray for you. Let's pray with you. Let's help you reach out. Have someone else carry that burden for you. <clears throat> so instead of inquiring of God where they were, they went to his house to weep. And now it's not bad to inquire where you're at, and you should do it all the time, but there is something incredibly powerful about doing it as a group, about opening up and saying, you know what, I have lost this battle twice now, right? So if there's a battle you can't win or a battle you see coming your way, don't just stay at home and inquire. Show up. Be where other people are. Weep with each other. Love with each other. Help each other. In Exodus 20:24, 20, Make an altar of earth for me and sacrifice on it your burnt offerings and fellowship offerings, your sheep and goats and your cattle. Wherever I cause my name to be honored, I will come to you and bless you. God is saying, where, where you honor my name, I show up. Where I have set aside a place to honor me, I show up. So let's make that this place. Let's not judge someone on the battle they're fighting, on the battle they're losing. Let's just invite them to say, hey, you know what? Come hang out with us on Sunday. We ain't got it together, but we're walking some way. Right? Let's love each other to the point that we can weep collectively and celebrate collectively and start to win battles. We have a community that needs some battles won. We have people in our community that need to know they're not in this fight alone. So the second thing that they did, they fasted. They fasted that day until evening. Fasting is something that, I just learned this actually, the Bible doesn't actually require us to do that. Anyone else know that? I always thought it was a requirement to fast. It's not a requirement to fast, which is crazy to me. But what happens when we fast is we take our focus off our problem and we put it onto the only person that can handle that problem and the only person that can win that problem. And there's lots of different fasts, right? There's the Daniel fast. I've looked into it. There's not a lot of food. I don't know that I could do it, but I have to. Right? You have 21-day fast, you have one-day fast, you have lots of different things. The idea with a fast is to give up what you think you need to survive and watch God take its place and seek God to take its place. So if that's TV, that's, uh, I'm going to hate to say this, but maybe it's your cell phone. Okay, maybe it's my cell phone. Right? Maybe it's that cup of coffee in the morning. Maybe it's food. 
Sometimes all we need to do to change the tide of a battle is to change our focus. And the easiest way to change our focus is to realize that we have complete, apart from God, we are nothing. That the battle is won because he can show up and do it. So I have decided, if anyone wants to join me in this, to fast lunch and pray for this church. Because I love this church. For 12 years, you guys have supported me and you guys have loved me. And I keep thinking about, what if there is another person out there like me that just needs a church that's going to love them and support them and bring them into the fold and reveal their calling and then push them into their calling when maybe they don't really want it? But we can be that church, guys. I know that it feels a little sparse today. But man, what if we fast and prayed for someone to sit in this chair right here? That the battle for this chair is going to be won because we have given up something we think we need and let God put something else in its place. How cool would that be? Right? Fasting is not what we have to do, but we get to do it. So maybe there's something else that you want to join me in. So for the month of February, maybe not the entire month, but at least for the first two weeks, I'm going to be fasting and praying over lunches for the people in this community to find a chair at a church where they belong. Because that's how the victory for what we have and those people out there are going to go, are going to win. The second thing, burnt offering. And the... Um, they fasted that day until evening and presented burnt offerings. Okay, so we're not actually going to burn anything, which is sad. But this fire is, fire is cool. Um, I'm not. Pyrotechnics would be awesome. Burnt offering. The burnt offering is to be entirely consumed by flame as a sweet aroma to the Lord. The purpose of the burnt offering was the general atonement of sin and expression of devotion to God. This offering was for God alone. It was burnt up entirely and was meant as a payment. Burnt offering. I've had to spend some time this week studying what offerings, what it meant to have a burnt offering. And basically, they would take the offering and they would lay it on the altar and they would cut it open into little pieces. And then they would light fire to it. And literally, it would burn to ash. Because that offering was for God and God alone. What part of our life are we holding back? We're not going to burn anything, but burnt offerings nowadays would be like total submission. To give up everything I have, everything I am, to follow what God is doing. That seems crazy. It seems a little scary. It seems kind of big. Jesus was the ultimate sacrifice and offering but I think that we can have a part in it. Is there something that you're holding back? Is there a skill or a talent that you can lay on the altar that we can give completely to God? Meaning I'm not going to use it for personal gain. I'm not going to use it to gain money. I'm not going to use it to gain friends. I'm going to use it in the sole purpose of honoring God with it. Maybe it's money. Maybe it's a car. Maybe it's your voice. I don't know. But in order for us to really win the battle that is facing before us, we have to be willing to give something up wholly and completely for God and God alone. Meaning we don't take it back. The third thing that they did was a fellowship offering. What is a fellowship offering? It's voluntary. It is a voluntary offering of thanksgiving. If God has done something great for you, we give something great back to him. So I get that. And this is not a sermon. I would preach a sermon on tithes and, and giving. But who wants to do bare minimum when God does exponentially more than that? Does that make sense? God could create a gray world. God could create it so we have no fun. That we live this life in gray. I'm a huge Hunger Game fan. And every now and then I watch that movie and I think, man, I'm so glad 
I kind of live in the capital with all the color and not the outlying districts. What a fellowship offering is. Is it saying, I have given the atonement. I have given the minimum. Now I want to give more. I'm so overwhelmed with what you've done for me that I want to give more. And that's what the nation of Israel did. They fasted and they said, God, like, we are not getting this. Something is not right. We are not aligned where we need to be. And then they offered up a burnt offering. I am sure that they were hungry. I am sure that they, they were ready for a meal. And they said, we're going to give to God first. And it's going to be solely and wholly His. I'm not going to take it back. I'm not going to have my hand in there. I'm not going to wait around for leftovers. We're giving it to Him. And then they went another step. And they said, but we want to give more. It's not enough just for the burnt offering, but if we really want the victory, if we really want to beat that army, we are going to give more. Fellowship offering, it's a voluntary sacrifice given to God. Here's the thing. Fellowship offerings, we get to partake in. Right? So it's not stuff that's necessarily God and God alone. It means that we get to share in it as well. So, um, anyway, to, to wrap up, my laptop or my tablet decided it. 5% is up. It is done. We, we live in a culture that needs us to be leaders. We live in a culture and we live in a community that needs us to be different. We have chairs. And I'm not pushing just to fill the chairs because here's my thought on it. Every seat in a chair is one more soul saved. I could care less about anything else, but... Who walking around outside needs a seat here at this table? Who walking around outside needs us to walk with a purpose so in their aimless walking, they follow? What battle are we fighting that maybe we need to fast and pray and offer up and allow God, right? God says, yes, go, but I'm going to deliver them for you. So before we jump into anything, Enter the house of God. Pray, fast with each other, love with each other, cry with each other, fight for each other, and then we can step out into the world and win that victory. So, that is what I have today. Um, Next week is communion, and then the following week, I'm going to do a little bit of a sermon on two weeks on Ruth. So if you haven't figured it out, I love the Old Testament. I don't know why, but I do. It's awesome. I love Jesus, but the Old Testament is cool, probably because there's battles and fires and stuff. Um, So I'm going to pray, and then I'll pray over the food, and I hope everyone will stay and join us for some fellowship. We can all eat together in the house of God. So Father, I pray as we go on about this week, and we all have battles that we have to face, that you will remind us how we win, to get into alignment with you, to bring it to the people that we love and trust and are going to fight with us. There's offerings that you've asked for that maybe we've been scared to give, that you will give us a boldness to lay those out before you. Father God, fill our lives right now with thanksgiving to the point that it overflows and we desire to just give as much back to you because there is someone in this community that needs it. Put upon our hearts the people that you wish us to reach individually and collectively. Help us to have open hands, open arms, but more importantly, help people to know that when they are here, they don't fight alone, that we fight with them. So Father, we thank you for the weird book of Judges and all the stuff that happens in it, and just a reminder that when you go before us and we are aligned with you, that the battle is won. So we love you. Pray over the food. May it just be a blessing. Bless the hands that have so graciously prepared it. Just help us to have a sweet fellowship today, Father God, to just love and laugh and joke with each other. In your son's name we pray. Amen.